I think we're ready, finally. Uh, like Bart said, thank you so much for coming, everybody, in, in big numbers. Um, tonight, well, let's start. I'm Thijs, and this is Bart. Then we have David and Floortje Dessing. I think you all know her. These are our speakers tonight, and we'll be talking. First, I will start with uh, explanation or introduction about our project, why, uh, why we went to Central Asia and Afghanistan, what we did there. Uh, and then Floortje and David will talk about uh, actually David's work in Afghanistan. So let's get started. Um, why did we go to Central Asia? Because a lot of people don't even know these countries. And a lot of people I told them about, they, I said, well, I'm going to Tajikistan. And they said, well, you're making this up. Tajikistan doesn't exist. So maybe a little test. A little test. <laughs> You chose the wrong place up front. What's your name? Rick. Hi, Rick. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Could you stand up for me, please? A little applause for Rick here. Could you join me up front? I know you came from Afghanistan, but it's really close to all the other countries. But where is Tajikistan? Can you point it out on the map? You exactly got it, man. Yeah, i just been there. you just been there. <laughs> applause for Rick. A big applause for Rick. Thanks, man. I, that's a bit unfortunate for the points we're trying to make. <laughs> but Bart, you, you picked the wrong guy, but okay. So everybody knows where Tajikistan is then. <laughs> right, so here it is, Central Asia. We, we traveled to all these countries plus Afghanistan. And uh, well, the reason why is uh, I was very fascinated with these countries. Every time I looked at the map, I was thinking, oh, What's going on there? Who is living there? What are they doing in their day-to-day -day life? I had no idea how it looked like. So I was reading more and more about this, and I became very fascinated about it. And, and the idea formed to, uh, to start a project, a photography or documentary project. I was doing photography for a long time then. And um, there's one thing about Tajikistan. Uh, a lot of people ask me, is this where they make Tajiki sauce. <laughs> so this is Tajiki sauce. Very, very nice, very delicious, but this is Tajikistan. So a big difference. <laughs> so they're a little bit unknown countries. And um, so we started this project. I had, I had quit my job by then to uh, pursue my career in photography and, and telling stories. So I worked on this project and the idea was to, uh, well, to shine a light on these unknown and maybe misunderstood countries. Because we have a lot, lot of uh, preconceptions and judgments and opinions about uh, these places we don't know anything about. We don't know anything about their culture, their people, their religion, but still we have a certain opinion. People think it's dangerous, it's unsafe, people are not nice, not friendly. Um, so we were going to prove them wrong, because that's just not the case. People are very uh, open and warm and welcome, and you get invited all the time for tea, for lunch, for dinner, for a vodka, mostly vodka actually, <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, or to sleep at their home. That just happens all the time. That's the mentality over there. So meetings like that really changed our image of the country. And this, I think, is a perfect example. It's just a guy who wanted to greet us, and, and that happens all the time. So, um, let's see. Yeah, so, so this was the idea. The underlying message was, um, why do we let ourselves influence so much uh, with, with opinions, with prejudice, about places we don't know anything about? And especially today, because, well, the world can seem a bit negative now and then, because a lot of people don't understand each other, and then we have cultural misunderstanding, so, well, let's uh, do something about that then. Um, and we wanted to prove people back home that the image we have of unsafe countries, that's not really entirely correct. So, 
um, it, it was really a place where you can have uh, genuine and authentic interactions with people. And people over there, they just they want to talk to you because they want to talk to you, not because they want money from you or they have some hidden motive or agenda for themselves. It's not that they're thinking about themselves when they're talking with you, what sometimes happens here in the West, maybe. Um, so, and, and those are characteristics that, that are actually very nice and th that we miss in, in Western countries because we seem very focused on ourselves, making career, you know, earning money, social status. And people over there, they don't really attach a lot of value to that. And a lot of the people we met were, were actually very poor, but they shared everything with us, all their food, all, all their drinks, everything. So um, <coughs> it's also a very, very social environment or society. Well, luckily for me, I had Bart with me, who is our social butterfly. <laughs> Because I just, I sometimes I got tired at the end of the day, people all the time asking us everything, inviting us, and where are you from? Do you know this Dutch soccer player? Uh, do you want to come to my family's restaurant? Do you want to stay here? And all in a different language, so it was, took a lot of effort understanding that. So at the end of the day, I needed to be alone with a cold beer, but Bart gladly continued the conversations with everybody. <laughs> And uh, people were very, very helpful. They, they went out of their way to, uh, to help us. And so one example was at the World Nomad Games in Kyrgyzstan. And this is an, a sports and, and cultural event and they, they celebrate their traditional nomad sports and, and uh, cultures. So we were there, we were walking around, we were again invited in somebody's yurt, which is a traditional tent. Uh, we're having tea and dinner and whatever. And there was one guy, uh, Ali Beck, on the right, and he was the only guy speaking English, so he, he helped us out understanding everybody. And then he just, uh, well, he just appointed himself our guide for the rest of the week. We never asked him, we never invited him. He just, well, he went with us and <laughs> he took us everywhere, uh, get, got us food told us everything about the best places. He even got me in the press area of all the major events for which I forgot to apply, but he managed anyway. And that's just an example of how helpful they are. And we asked him, him so why are you helping us, man? What's up? We're just two guys coming to your country. And he said, when I see a foreigner in my country, I just want to show them uh, a good time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, ma we made a lot of good friends like that, actually. And another one is uh, Sabir from Tajikistan. He, he was a cool guy. He was a really cool guy. Like you said, the last one, Ali Beck, he wasn't the only one who was trying to help us for nothing, just to get to know us. He was one of them, too. This, this, he was our angel, our literal angel. We were in an, uh, a kind of a particular situation. It is pretty normal to hitchhike there uh, in, in Tajikistan. Um, so we sometimes just picked up some people and it was pretty, it was doing all right. But we don't know the way, not all the way of course in Tajikistan, so we had to ask a little bit. So we just asked for a direction. We wanted to go to a little village, but it was halfway on a big capital. So all right, we were asking where, where's the big place at? And they were pointing there, there. And so they thought they are going to the big place. And we were sitting there with the two of us in a very big car. And they saw the space in the back. All right, there's room for more people here. So just one woman got in the back of our car. And she was sit yeah, just sitting there. And she was, all right, let's go. And we're like, huh? <laughs> what? No, I'm not going all the way. And we were like trying with hands and feet like, this place, no go. Halfway, it's OK. But she was very persistent, and with, there was no movement at all. And there was a kind of a little discussion going around, and nobody spoke, spoke English. We didn't speak Russian or Tajik or anything. So finally, all of a sudden, the golden voice, can I help you? Finally, some, some foreign English words. This was this guy, Sabir. He got the whole crew of 25 people out of the way. He got the woman out of the back. And he filled pretty good. And he filled the back with himself and his wife. He, he actually lived in the place where we had to go to. So that was a big plus. And, and he not only just lived in a place where, where, he, where we uh, had to go to, he also had another house, a little guest house. Beautiful, 
and uh, his mother was was uh, the uh, the principal of school so we went behind the school parked the car in the basketball field and we got our own second house it was his guest house next to the river uh, just to the to the border of afghanistan no one around uh, and he said yeah sure you can stay for as long as you want next morning he came up with fresh fish he talked a story we fished we swam it was just beautiful. And we made our best friend, and we, we are still in contact with a guy uh, in one day. And even when we left, he, 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 he had to pink away a little tear. This was really touching, really moving. And this was only day three of our journey. So yeah, this was, this yeah. was good. It was a special meeting because uh, nobody ever cries over me leaving someplace. <laughs> <laughs> Except my mom, of course. <laughs> So uh, all these meetings, we had many meetings like this all the time. So that really changed our perspective about the country, about the, about the persons living there. They're all very warm and welcoming. And that's really what we learned with all these encounters. There was only one uh, prejudice that we could not deny, unfortunately. And that is that they like to drink vodka because they really do. <laughs> Uh, I think my liver is still hurting a little bit from <laughs> Central Asia. And this was also at the World Nomad Games, but we renamed it the World Vodka Games, actually, because <laughs> it was... <laughs> well, we were there and there was this uh, group of guys. They saw us standing, they waved us over, and, and this guy on the right, he started talking very enthusiastic, very excited, and he was introducing everybody. We didn't speak the same language, but still he was talking a lot to us. And we kind of understood him. He had very good gestures, so we could understand him quite well. And, and they were uh, members of a Kyrgyz tribe, the Mundus tribe, and they were just here to talk about their uh, traditions, their way of life, and, and showcasing all that. And one of them guys just started playing on his accordion beautifully. And then uh, they asked us, do you want to stay in our yurt uh, the next night and bring some bottles of vodka with you? So we said, OK, sure, sure, sure. We came there the uh, next evening, and we didn't saw any, any of those guys. There was, we didn't recognize anybody. So, but there were people there, and they told us to go inside the yurt, and then it was 8 o'clock, and we thought, oh, we're just going to sleep with 12 strangers in this very big tent. Okay, and then, uh, but, but then they, the guys, they come storming in, they took us outside, and uh, they said, well, put on some warm clothes and follow us. So we went to sit up somewhere on a hill, uh, overlooking the entire yurt camp, and we started drinking with them, and we started talking with them all night, with a little bit of help of uh, Google Translate. But we talked about everything, about religion, about life, about what it means to be happy, all those stuff, even though we didn't spoke the same language. And suddenly they started singing a traditional song, they started reciting poetry, they said a prayer for us because they're Islamic uh, religion. And at one point, uh, so this guy said, well, there is some party going on downstairs, do you want, or downstairs somewhere in the camp, do we want to go? So we said, sure, 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 we go. But he said to us, uh, you must not show that you are drunk. And while he was saying that, he was kind of rolling backwards from the hill. <laughs> so Bart and I, we carried him down and we said, well, I think we're all right. Maybe you shouldn't show that you're drunk. And well, just to give you a very short uh, indication of how that party went down, this is the kind of, uh, well, it's very different from Amsterdam parties, isn't it? So that, that was a very nice party, but they kept on insisting that we would uh, sing a Dutch song, actually. So, uh, no, we're not going to sing it now, but I just... <laughs> well, I, I passed that honor to Bart. He has an amazing voice. So I said, uh, well, Bart, you can take this one. And he did a beautiful version of Django Wagner's Blaue Oge. My fave. Yeah, it's classic. <laughs> Um, so it was it was a really great night, one of the best nights ever, actually. Yeah, it, it was a good one, and I'm really not going to show you my voice right now. You should go with us on a journey to Tajikistan next time. You might hear it. Um, but after all of that, uh, we had a lot of fun, met a lot of people, but we needed some rest. 
also from the vodka. We have to recover our livers. So there's no better place to recover from the vodka than, of course, Afghanistan, right? Yes. <laughs> so we move to Afghanistan, uh, which, well, like Bart says, is a bit different from Central Asia because it's, it's very strict in uh, Islamic religion. It's also quite unsafe because there has been a war for about 40 years now. Um, this all started in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded, and actually before that, Afghanistan was a very uh, popular tourist destination. A lot of tourists came there on their way to India. It was on the hippie trail, and it was very, well, a lot more liberal and open than it, was, than it is now. So, unfortunately, the war happened, Taliban took power, then the U.S. Army invaded, and they're still there, and it has been one of the longest and most costly wars uh, for the United States for about 100 billions of dollars. Um, so, and, and terrorist attacks unfortunately have become almost normal for the people living there almost every day. It happens, suicide bombings, all that stuff. And so we had to take some uh, safety measures to travel there, of course. So we're traveling in uh, just normal low-key taxis in local hotels, not in the international hotels. We couldn't tell anybody about our uh, travel plans, not even the police. And we had to wear the Afghan clothing, which is uh, this one. <laughs> just, just to be sure, this is not a regular picture on the street. This is Thais and me, for in yeah, case you I didn't recognize us. Thais is on the right. You didn't yeah. see it, but those are us, yeah. So it's actually a very comfortable pajama. <laughs> and uh, in this way, we traveled around. And it's, it's a lot safer than you would think uh, with all the news that you get. But it's actually, you know, if you take this precaution, it's it's well, I wouldn't say perfectly fine, but it's, you can travel there, yeah. Um, and so, of course, maybe you would think, like, why do you want to go there? Because of the war and the terrorism. But this was in line with our project. We want to show a different side uh, from all the stuff that we know, all the stuff that we hear about, and show that there is also a side uh, without the war, without terrorism. There's just people living there. Um, you might build up an image in your mind of, of, of a wasteland of people throwing bombs at each other, killing each other all day. This is not true, of course. They're, people um, continue their life, their daily life. They're just looking for the same thing we are looking for here, actually, which is just pursuit of happiness, uh, trying to raise your children, and that's kind of it. That's what we all are looking for, of course. And uh, so we met the people who are very warm again, very friendly, and they were very proud that we came to visit as a tourist and not as an official or an, an army or anything like that. So to bring a more colorful image of this country, we wanted to show not the, the, the conflict. I didn't want to show pictures of the army in combat with a terrorist or the aftermath of a suicide bombing, anything like that. I just wanted to show the other side of the country that we don't see uh, because of the war. And there are actually just well, a lot of friendly faces around. So I want to, to, to work up this colorful image. I want to talk about all the meetings we had, but all the people who invited us, this was just a random guy on the mountain to ask if we want to stay at, at his home. And uh, about all the people we met on the street, they all wanted to ask us, where are you from? And they managed to get a few words English out of them with, with a lot of effort. And uh, why would we visit? Where are we from? What are we doing? We're very interested. Uh, we got invited by our guide at his home. We feasted on, on incredible food. It's really delicious. We got super high with the <laughs> yeah, a caretaker of the Afghanistan mosque, the oldest mosque in Afghanistan. So I think if, if we focus on these kind of meetings, then we can paint a very different picture of this country, which is a more colorful picture, which is a picture where uh, people are just living their life. It's not just all misery and pain. And, and that was the main goal of, the, of this project. So um, luckily, we, we learned that there were some positive developments in this country, uh, which was we saw that the first time on uh, the episode of Floyd Dessing in Afghanistan, which is the circus school of David Mason. And we, we were very, uh, well, we saw that episode and we thought, oh, we're going as well to, uh, to Kabul. 
So we're going to interview him as well, have a visit. And we were very inspired and touched. And uh, we got Busquets very special work. And it's a, it's a place where laughter and joy happens, even though uh, all this war and stuff is going on on the outside. Um, so David told us he got a lot of positive feedback from uh, Dutch people after the episode of Florida. A lot of messages, a lot of donations. Uh, and he said to us, well, I really would love to go to the Netherlands to, to talk about this. So then we were there and we said, of course, man, we're going to arrange all that for you. Well, it was in the moment, of course, the heat of the moment was a little bit emotional. Bart had to cry, I didn't. And then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true, Bart. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, in the end, I'm very glad that it worked out, that we could do this here, that David is here, that Florge is here. So I'm very glad that we can give a chance for him to uh, share his story. So now I would like to give the word to Florgia, who is going to talk first a little bit about her experience there, and then we'll have David on stage as well. So please give it up for Florgia <coughs> Dessing. Thank you so much, guys. <clears throat> um, thank you so much. Very inspiring to hear your story. Thanks for having me here on the stage. And of course, thank you so much for having David here on the stage in a little while. Um, well, for those of you who don't have a clue who I am, um, I'm a, a Dutch presenter making uh, show, shows for Dutch public television. And I've been doing travel shows for over 20 years. Uh, a bit of a dino, but um, it's something I've been doing my whole life, not because uh, I decided I want to be on television, but I've always been traveling ever since I was very young. And I, uh, I was happened to be so lucky to be able to to make this into my job, into my in my my real job, my work. Um, it was really nice to hear you. Where are you now? No, there you are. Um, to hear you talk about Central Asia. Uh, to hear you talk with love about Central Asia, and um, because it's it's one of these parts of the world where not a lot of people know about. Uh, they sort of forget it. They fly over it when they go to Bangkok or when they go to Asia, wherever they're going, and they sort of like, it's, it's not on everybody's radar, because it's very unknown. And I've always tried to make programs about very unknown places. My show is about people living far, far away from civilization for a very good reason. So not people, people who are born into a, a country, but who happened to be born somewhere else, or maybe in a country, but move somewhere for a very good reason. And uh, we call it the forgotten places or the end of the world. And I think you can call Central Asia pretty much the end of the world. I've been there a few times myself. Uh, we also made a normal, regular travel show. And um, we once did a trip from Amsterdam by car to China, which I can really advise to everyone to do that. It sounds crazy, but, you know, just hit the gas and keep on putting gas in your car. And you'll end up definitely in, by, in Beijing. And it's a crazy, it's a crazy, beautiful, incredible trip. You, you've told us already a lot about Central Asia, so I'm not getting into that all the all the way. But um, before I left, my mom was the same. She was like, "Oh, why? Oh, why do you want to do this?" But uh, it's and, and and a lot of people told us it's unsafe, and you know, a lot of stuff can happen if you travel by car. And it was just me and a cameraman or a camera woman. Well, the only thing that ever happened to us on this whole long journey, which took us about three months, was um, like uh, one time, well, we got stuck in the sand, uh, which is just not smart. And then we also got uh, stopped by a police officer. And he told me, he looked very mean at me. He said, you did a big mistake because you did blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I crossed a line or something. So he said, you have to pay a thousand dollars. And I said, no, I'm not going to pay. <laughs> and then he said, okay, a hundred. I said, no. <laughs> I said, okay, 10. I said, okay. So I thought, <laughs> that was, because it was so cute that he was saying it this way. And that was literally the only negative thing we had while traveling through Central Asia. And I'm not making up. It's exactly what you say. It's very friendly, open people. It's, it's people who were literally forgotten by the world. Um, when they have so much to offer. So I can literally advise anybody, if you want to broaden your horizon, go
go to one of those countries there. It's, it's fascinating, and they're so heartwarming and so welcoming to everybody. Um, one other trip, but well, I've, I've always, um, one of the main reasons I'm doing this show on television is because I want to, um, I want to tell all these stories that there are to be told in the world, and there are millions and millions of stories because so many people have a great story. And um, when you make a television show, you are able to to reach these places which are pretty much locked up. You can do the same with what you do when you start making photos, or or as a traveler, go there by yourself. But for me, it's beautiful to be able to share it with a lot of people, with the viewers. <clears throat> and I w I don't want to preach. I don't want to say, oh look what these people do and uh, you know, worship them or cherish them. I just want to show what's out there. I just want to show that there's so much more than the world that we know and that I know. And that there's a lot of people in this world who are living outside of the box or who are living with a lot of courage. And there's so many people that I meet that I'm really humbled by because the choices they make for me are unbelievable. You know, I do all these crazy trips and we, <clears throat> oh, those last years we went to to a lot of uh, very difficult places like uh, Syria, and, um, Yemen, and uh, and that's not to brag, but it's just that those those are the trips that you're doing that are pretty m scary. Um, also for me, I, I I really get scared when I I have my producers here. You, he, he always is. He's not mad at me when I go, but he's sort of like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, but we do go also to Afghanistan. And then when we we're, I remember being, for instance, at the border of. Syria and you you really stand there and you really you almost wet your pants because you're like really what am I doing but as soon as you go and you jump in the cold water as I say you sort of understand why you do it is to have this experience and always when you arrive somewhere you meet all these incredible people and you see literally what you said Thais that the world is also moving and the people are also trying to live a normal life in a lot of these places this where we, we've been to Baghdad of uh, uh, Damascus two years ago, and there, there people are sitting there on the terrace drinking cappuccino and eating sushi. And at the same time, two kilometers away, there's like fierce fighting going on in cer certain areas. And that's, those are the things I always also want to show to the people here in Holland. Uh, I want to show them that everywhere in the world, people are trying to make a living and there's also a lot of people in the world who are trying to make this, it sounds super cheesy, but who are trying to make it a little bit better, their, in their own environment. And those are the people that I'm so inspired with. And those, a lot of those people we're trying to find for uh, my program, Floortje at Einde van de Wereld. So to cut a long story short, that was also the reason why I really, really wanted to go to Afghanistan. Uh, we talked about it, me and my producer, of, uh, or how do you call it, uh, whatever, my long time buddy Hanneke, uh, we talked a lot about Afghanistan, Afghanistan because uh, uh, we knew from from instant that we did we wanted to tell a story there because this lit, the country is only in the news in a very negative way. You see all, when you see it on the, on the news, it's always that there's been a, like a bomb attack or a suicidal bomber or a rocket attack or there's the Taliban uh, going on. So, but there is also, like you were also mentioning, so much going on there with a, a, a normal life, a street life. You can literally just, when you're in Kabul, um, you can have a, a cup of tea somewhere, a cup of tea, and people come up to you and want to hear your story. Um, so we talked about Afghanistan and we wanted to do a story there, but it's hard to find a foreigner living there. Um, and, but we decided, like, if it's, if this is not literally the end of the world. It's not, this is not a, an island somewhere hidden in the, in the Pacific. But who would want to live there? Who wants to live there voluntarily? Who gives up his life in a, in a beautiful, safe, nice country like we have here, like in Holland, uh, to live in a very unstable environment like Kabul? So that was the challenge we had to find that. Now, we found this project, which is, um, skate, what's it called? Skatistan, yeah, it's it's a bunch of people who are trying to 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 get the the, the youngsters of uh, Kabul on skateboards, but we we dug deeper into it, and then I started talking. We started talking uh, with uh, Natalie Wrighton. She's a very famous Dutch journalist who works for the Volkskrant, and she's been living there for five years. 
and we got to talk and she introduced me to her her very good friend Tom and uh, he he'd also been living in uh, in Afghanistan and he told us no you should see David and Barrett and their circus school so we were like immediately triggered like who wants to start a circus school in Kabul that's not the 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 the, the, the usual thing you would expect in a country like that. So we started digging into the story and uh, we, we got in touch and immediately felt that this was a, is a great story. So we started uh, preparing this whole trip, which is, is a lot of uh, work for, uh, for a producer because um, there's all these safety issues involved. You have to talk to the amb ambassador. Don't know if you guys did that. Yeah. Did they knew you were coming? Yeah, yeah. No? yeah. Yeah, to yeah, the yeah. embassy, yeah, no, of no. course. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the Dutch embassy, yeah. yeah. We so were not going for the for the whole movie uh, permit, but yeah, just as They knew tourist. you were there, yeah, yeah. But so yeah. so you have, they have to know you were there, and then you have to have a safe hotel, you have to have a fixer, you have to have a driver, in our case, because we were also carrying equipment, we had to have all the permissions. <clears throat> and we were, very, we were on a very tight uh, filming schedule, so we, it was really like a hit and run in, film, 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 travel, travel a little bit, and out again because we wanted to shorten the, the amount of time we would be there. So in that case, it, it's a bit different. I have to, I have to add that like, there's hardly any uh, foreigners going there nowadays. There, are, there have been a few daredevils uh, who've been there. There's also a, a travel company who organizes really a trips to Afghanistan for, for, they say, daredevils, but it's very, very unsafe and very un unwise to do so. So when you go there, you're either working for an NGO or you're a journalist. So, but we finally uh, got all the permissions and uh, we went. I, uh, I also went with a cameraman who works only for the news, the Dutch news, and who's been in Afghanistan for 20 times or something. So yeah, it was pretty, he, he knew the place very well and, uh, and the guy who'd been living there. So we took all the measure, measurements to make sure that this, uh, the trip was as safe as it could be, but of course it's always, there's always a risk involved. Anyway, we got to David's place and it was, uh, it was worth every, every inch of, of sweat. We sweated before going there. It was um, a very, very truly inspiring place together with his partner, Barrett. Very important to mention her as well. Um, uh, David is going to uh, uh, do uh, some more talking about the school. Um, for us, it was um, very important to tell this story to the Dutch audience to show the other side of Afghanistan. It's a story about resist uh, per persistence, about uh, um, believing in something that a lot of people don't believe in, and most of all, believing in the power of the people who actually live there, and especially the young children. So without further, how do you say that? I do. Please introduce David. So David, hi. I'm, I'm going to stick around a little bit here. Maybe we can have a seat. They're all placed here. so uh, Or stand up, whatever you prefer. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here. And uh, thank you. And thank everybody to give me this opportunity uh, I must say that it is very special because otherwise uh, we are behind the mountains with the kind of work we do. Uh, we don't get enough or any kind of exposure. Nobody can see, can know what we do. Other organizations have lots of um, um, promotion uh, staff and sometimes they become even louder than what they actually do. <laughs> but uh, for us, well, we tried at, at the beginning to do it the right way, to approach the right way, the big heads, the, the right money, UNICEF, all of this. And we found out that um, it's not the right way. We should do it the wrong, wrong way. And um, uh, we started with the children. Because, <laughs> sorry for interfering to you, but maybe it's very uh, good for us, for, for the audience first, yeah. to sort of have a bit of an idea what, who you are, first yeah. of all, and maybe I can sort of ask you a little yes. bit about that. So, please, uh, <laughs> no, you're David, uh, yeah. not born in Afghanistan. No. Where were you born? I was born in Iran, the neighbor country. The map is gone. It is the next, uh, next door. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and how, for how long did you live there? 
um, many years, like uh, my teenager, everything was there. And then I have been traveling a lot for, um, I have traveled uh, in 58 uh, countries. And I have been, I am, I, am a, I am still a little bit, but I have always been restless to, to, to find what is the life about, what is, what is the meaning of, you know, what is this all about? And um, oh, yeah. I have been take half a minute. <laughs> yeah, traveling a lot. Yeah, and, and and so you you did 58 countries. Yeah. During that um, that that you know drifting around the world, were you already? In, what was the first time you went to Afghanistan? When was that? Um, so first time it was uh, the time that Russians were still there in Afghanistan. They were just about to withdraw, and. Um, um, I I was curious. Which is and the beginning of, help me out, 80s. Uh, yeah. The date. Uh, I oh, don't know. blank, blank. <laughs> long time ago. How long ago? Yeah, long ago? time ago. Uh, it is 30 years ago. 30 something? years ago. Yeah. That was your first visit in Afghanistan. It was yeah. a complete different country by then, eh? Country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very different than uh, it is now. But what was the what was the big difference? Uh, I think um, uh, at that moment, at that uh, time of the um, uh, the war, as the Russians were withdrawing, uh, there was hope, and everybody was waiting that finally uh, Russians are uh, going out, and uh, the country would be in hands of the Afghans. But that never happened, and I must um, say a bit. The war did not start with uh, Russians. Before the Russians, there were already a little bit of war. And um, well, uh, the story is that uh, that um, other countries started the war, and among them, there are. Um, well, should I go to the details of the daf tour? Well, then, we have, very a, good, then uh, we have a long evening. I well, think, I'm extremely good about children. Yes, but uh, uh, sorry for for interfering you, but for for just. To give a bit of a uh, for the for the people who here, of course we know we know something about Afghanistan. Yeah. But how would you describe the nature of the country when when you found it already for the first time? What is a real? What is like he was explaining about Tajikistan, yeah. for instance. Can yeah. you say it's the same in Afghanistan as in when it comes to hospitality? In your opinion? Oh, definitely. That is uh, the uh, the the best describing uh, Afghans their hospitality and their generosity uh, and uh, they, they have uh, uh, many different ethnicities and cultures, languages, colors uh, and uh, what they all have in common is their generosity and hospitality I would say. Yes, and and what, um, what drew you to the country? What, 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 what was it for you that made it so special? Um, well I was um, well, I think everything is everything is special in a, in a different way, and that's why I went to Afghanistan, but I went to lots of other countries as well. Yeah, and, and I think also Afghanistan is one of these countries that is really crushed by the world, the history, yeah, because there's a lot of countries Interests. fighting over this because it because of its uh, strategic position in the world. Yeah. it's on, on a lot of, like it's on trade routes. Yeah. Do the Afghan people also feel that they're sort of crushed by all external factors? Like, yeah. bef for instance, the situation in Yemen right now. Yeah, yeah they are definitely disappointed to uh, see that uh, uh, nobody has the interest for, uh, for them, for their future. And it's all, always it is their own interests. It is strategically... Um, uh, situated in a place that everybody wants to have a, a hand on it. Yeah, everybody wants to fight over it. So y you were there for the first time. How did you get the, the idea to, to go back there? And how much later was that? Um, so um, in um, 2001, 11th of September, when the uh, World Trade Center um, happened, um, then in the U.S., the attack the US, on the yes, the attack on uh, on the U.S. Uh, I said in the TV, and then just in a couple of days, it was quite clear that in Afghanistan there are going to be some radical changes, opening of some uh, some possibilities. 
At the same time, I had a plan uh, of quite different life. Uh, but then I thought this is maybe much, 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 much better for me because uh, I know the language, I know the people, I know the culture, uh, the religion, and the kind of information, knowledge I have from one hand, the uh, insight to the culture uh, of the both West and East. And from the other hand, there is a, a child in me. I have kept this child in myself that gives me uh, another double insight, one to the adult life and the other one to the chi children's life. So here I was in a kind of uh, crossroad where adult children, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, Western uh, possibilities all could uh, uh, go through me and I could be the, the medium, the device to release some of the uh, positive energies and uh, make something good happen for the children of Afghanistan. But what I think is very interesting is that you say you saw this incredible heavy thing happening on television and you said you saw an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. It, that's very, that's a contradiction because most people see just you know, well, terror. Um, yes, but the result of that terror uh, was the war on terror uh, that was, uh, uh, as I said, opening of the new possibilities that the uh, uh, West decided to go to Afghanistan and um, uh, then I could go and do, make, it some, make, make, make some positive. Uh, but why particularly Afghanistan, why? Because there were a lot of uh, um, countries that were you know, yeah. involved in this whole axis of evil, as, as President yeah. Bush then called it. Um, uh, I, I knew the language. I, you know, as Iranian, as uh, somebody who was born in Iran, I, have a, I had a very good uh, insight to, um, to, to Afghanistan. And um, uh, I, you know, but I was planning, uh, I could, Rich, and um, I, I used to be dance instructor, and with that job or that uh, work, I could only uh, reach very few people. Then I thought, uh, I have here a whole country, one. The second, they are so miserable. They, they are so in need. Why should I be uh, entertaining uh, rich people and rich people kids? You know, this is not satisfying for me. And um, uh, the third is that, there are many people who can do uh, uh, dance instruction, who can do what I could do in Afghanistan. And uh, so it was kind of a voice, a, a calling says that, go to Afghanistan, go to Afghanistan. It was out of your reach, it was somewhere out there that it happened yeah. to you. But, and then also you mentioned the fact that you felt this child in you. In what way do you, can, do you, can you, like, how do you say that? You feel with them, you, you, you're at um, their level, you know what they sort of like, they want to play, they want to learn. They yeah, I, I think um, maybe it comes from my own uh, childhood, but, and, and problems never solved, like the love I never had. And, uh, from your parents? From, uh, yeah, from, um, from the past. So the, the restrictions, the problems, uh, whatever I had, it, it made me to, uh, to have a kind of, I think, adult and child parallel life together at the same time, and I, I have been growing with this, from uh, having very thoughtful ideas from very, uh, very young, that children are not supposed to be uh, that, uh, that deep. And at the same time, uh, still I, am, uh, I have some, some childish ideas, childish uh, interests, and I think uh, that made me uh, to have a very good access uh, to the children. So uh, when I'm in Afghanistan, when I talk with a child, uh, I am not the adult talking with the child. It's a child talking with a child. And I can feel it and I can uh, experience it. And that gives me a kind of, um, um, kind of insight to make the right decision, to make the right, uh, to understand, even if not making the right decision, to understand what it's all about. The same is about uh, when somebody only understands the language because reading it in the university and go to Afghanistan, and in speaking with, with an Afghan, they think understand what they say, but there are much more is said between the lines that, he, that uh, in no university you can learn the, that, that, that language. It's interesting to, to talk uh, with you about your childhood, because I remember when we were filming, yeah. 
I, it's, it's, it, for you, it was, it was uh, very hard to talk about childhood. It was very talk about, uh, uh, difficult for you, which, which is normal. I, I'm a stranger to you, and I come into your life, and I'm starting to ask all these private questions. Because yeah. I try to explain to you that when, when I'm trying to tell a story, it it's makes it so much more in-depth when you hear somebody's personal story yeah. or his motivation. And I remember it was, it, you, you sort of like half trying understood why, why I was being so yeah. poking into your, in your, in your trying stomach. Trying to avoid your... Yeah, <laughs> trying to avoid my questions all the time, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm doing the same. Yeah, <laughs> it was so, remember, I remember sitting in that restaurant <laughs> And I told you, okay, now we're going to go talk a little bit about your child. And you were like, really? Do we have to do that? <laughs> yeah, well, and I explained it to you. And then we started talking, and you sort of like, <clears throat> you closed. And I kept on asking. I remember we sat there for like two hours or something. Yeah. And then all, all of a sudden, you sort of crept out of your little, you know, your little hideaway, which I can totally understand <laughs> and agree. But it's, 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 it's moving to, to hear you talk about it now. And to see how you used that childhood um, into your work, because you know you've 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 created something, yeah, very um, how should I say it, very strong and valuable for a country. And it takes a lot of courage to start something like this together with your partner. Let's not forget her, she's yeah. very important. Well, it wouldn't be the MMCC as it is now uh, without uh, uh, Berit's uh, extremely, uh, with this extreme high capacity that she has uh, with her co uh, contribution in, in the last 17 years. Yeah, because it's 70 years already. Yeah. And let's go to the project now. Let's move into what you're actually doing. How would you describe what you set up there together with Berit? Um, so, it is, um, it is basically facilitating and uh, bringing the possibilities of growth uh, for the children. But to do that, there are a few things you need to know. First, who are they? So, uh, very often people think that, okay, what is good for uh, Dutch kids must be good for Afghan kids too. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Uh, the identity, the necessity, the, the needs, everything is different. And we need to first, one thing to do anything for Afghan children, to know who they are, what is their needs, because they are absolutely different. In what way? Can you describe that short? Uh, yeah, uh, so um, let's say um, uh, here maybe uh, education and behaving good and all of these things uh, are good uh, skills to have, good properties to, uh, to own. Uh, because it gives you the possibility of growth in, uh, in Western world. But uh, in Afghanistan, when you don't have that uh, infrastructure, uh, the social, economical, uh, the educational, when you don't have that structure, uh, if you behave properly, if you, uh, as understood here, or if you uh, only try to uh, study or go to school, this is not enough because you would be, uh, you're not immune to many of the um, problems that you have in Afghanistan. You need to have other skills. And it starts with um, identifying yourself, believing in yourself, cleaning up your traumas, and um, uh, making a very strong uh, uh, personality that, that, that is fully in, uh, in control of uh, emotional and uh, physical control. And then uh, you expand it to uh, resource social activities to, uh, to have your social activities increase in terms of being part of the, being a realistic part of your, the community you, are, uh, you belong to and uh, contribute to it. It is uh, very different than uh, what Westerners usually think is or prescribe for Afghanistan or Afghan kids. You set up, you could say, yeah, it is a circus school. Um, it, that might make it look like you have all these kids just doing, being a clown or juggling or whatever. But for you, it's so much more eh, than, than what we consider to be, oh, a circus school, oh, then you could do tricks and then that's it. 
How, how do you see that? What's your philosophy behind it? Um, you explained already yeah. about the children, but why, why a circus school? Um, there are a few different reasons, but the main reason is that, um, uh, that circus is the best tool uh, to approach children and then uh, to build up, uh, to, uh, to clean up the traumas and to make children to, uh, f to, to start having hope and uh, believing in themselves and, uh, and uh, becoming social. So you cannot uh, teach them on the blackboard. You cannot uh, you know, uh, tell them, do this, do that. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and the joy it brings that alone is a lot of uh, trauma dropping in. Uh, I, 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 uh, neither me or my, Barrett, my partner, has the um, uh, background or even interest for circus as circus, as art or culture. But we realize that children love it, they want it, and then uh, by teaching them, there are ways to uh, bring that joy and these skills to serve them as a uh, trauma therapy tool and bring it much more to the, to the levels that no other device can do. Maybe sooner or later I should yeah. start to... Yeah, because it's to really nice to show uh, an, an example yeah, of, uh, uh, of what you guys are doing. Maybe if yeah. Here. yeah, give me a second. Because for you, uh, like you said, you you sort of you also look a little bit like you could be in the circus, like you could be <laughs> like a, a trapeze artist, you know, yeah. kind of, but <laughs> uh, or this snake guy <laughs> who can fold himself into a, an eight or something. What the clown? <laughs> <laughs> Not the clown. The clown. Barrett is the clown. No, <laughs> no, not at all. But uh, so for you, it's all about the yeah. skills. And what what are we going to see here? So um, before this, maybe I should show you a couple of. Um, Slides, yep. Here. <laughs> We're not like super professional, but it all comes from the heart. <laughs> yeah, and that's... Um, that's what it's all about. Now you cannot touch the screen. <laughs> it's not touch the screen. <laughs> These are clips you made yourself. Is it working? It is somewhere else. It is here. Maybe you can explain something about it. I re recognize this. This is in your old uh, location, eh? So, uh, this alone is a huge achievement. Imagine we are, we are talking about children in Afghanistan. We're not talking about normal children that are happy anyway, anywhere. So uh, the happiness, the joy, the laughter, which is entertainment in the West, uh, in Afghanistan, maybe I don't need this, I think. In Afghanistan, uh, it is not entertainment. It is uh, living, it is uh, having hope, having, uh, it is living, you know? It is big, it's all they have gone through with the wars, with the uh, restrictions, with especially the girls, uh, they, they, they should be all depressed, and they are, they are many of them. So the, the magic in circus is not the magic of uh, magicians, it is the magic that uh, it is so powerful uh, with, the, uh, with the colors, with the visuals, with the sound, with the fun, it makes any depressed, any uh, traumatized kid to uh, say to give another chance to life, to start to smile. And what, what, what you just saw here, um, we didn't instruct them to do none of those. We just provided them the, uh, the skills, the, the, uh, how they can juggle, how they can have fun, and they have lots of tools and equipment. And we let them themselves to pick up uh, whatever um, skills or act they want. And they've been having fun. And look, girls and boys together in Afghanistan, when brothers and sisters don't see each other, and lots of problems later in their life come from this uh, alienation, not knowing what is woman for men, what is not, and, and, and the vice versa. But here, like sisters and brothers, they uh, live together, uh, play together, and they get a, 
different understanding of uh, who they are. Um, just for the um, therapeutic Well, first, maybe I, I, I start to tell you a bit about uh, the educational entertainment <coughs> performances we call the EDU shows. Um, so these are messages given to the children by, uh, by the children, uh, like health messages. <laughs> Quite obvious, no? Uh, this is about uh, diversity of Afghan uh, ethnicity. So they learn about each other and they respect even solar system you can, you can teach here. This one is about polio, uh, that you know, two drops of polio vaccine can be given to these uh, symbols of the two snakes that are, uh, that make the children and adults understand and respect the vaccination. Uh, this one is about hand wash or Diarrhea prevention, which is the biggest killer in Afghanistan of the children, and has been performed by children mainly in many places. Malaria prevention, again about Afghanistan. Uh, so this is one uh, dimension of uh, one aspect of uh, social circus. Uh, to give messages to children, which is not only in the brain, uh, but uh, is imprinted in the muscles, so they get an emotional um, contact with the message. For example, with the polio, they really are scared of the snakes, and somehow, not only their brain uh, that applies to, to their memory, but, but uh, their body uh, understand the message. But what you what you say is true. I mean, you just provide them the tools to to do whatever yeah. they can be, uh, and they cannot only represent joy or anything, but also uh, a pretty cool thing about social status. I mean, like most of you know, in in most of the the Muslim countries, uh, the girls are not equal with the boys. When we arrived at David in Kabul, there was uh, a young woman, a beautiful woman, and and she was proudly presenting uh, as our skills. Um, and she was juggling pretty good. After that, she was juggling together with uh, another girl, even better. After that, there was some spe special thing happening. She was, uh, what's it called, stilts? stilts? Yeah, stilts. She was walking on stilts, juggling, after that, with a big Afghani flag. And I didn't really realize what was happening, but he explained me, what you're looking over here, what you're seeing over here, is really special. There's a small girl, higher than the man, proudly waving her flag, her flag, chin up, and, and when you look at it like that, it's really special what you're doing there. There is no other tool in the whole universe to give a feeling of um, uh, becoming grown up uh, one meter, one and a half meters higher on their stilts and experience uh, big men watching them. Yeah, because usually children from here, they can see this part of the adult men, and then they think that adult men and women are weak, dangerous, strong, and uh, they always keep this um, bad balance. Uh, but when they, especially girls, uh, go on stilts and uh, see themselves uh, as high as they see, uh, and uh, uh, have a different perspective of the adult, that does something with, uh, with their psyche and uh, open up some, some, uh, some ideas. You know, uh, these are the therapeutic um, tools. But here in this pyramid, you see, uh, the pyramid, people, many people think is uh, nice, and it looks nice, or this pyramid. But what, is, what happens here is that we are teaching children how to uh, increase their social skills, how to understand each other, respect each other, and uh, give a space to each other, so they don't fight, you know, to make um, 
four, two, three, two, one, like four stage pyramid like that, any of them need to be very much aware of first their own body, uh, but then how is their two uh, feet they are pushing and how much they are pushing and uh, how they are supporting the one on top of them from here and from here and from here. So it is not the memory remember be nice to the others. No, it is the entire uh, body. Every single muscle in the skeleton, every single fiber of the muscle uh, are uh, trying to understand the message to give the space to the others who are on top of them and not be uh, harsh on the others. So this message uh, that is not in the memory, not on the uh, blackboard, it is imprinted in the muscles, in the, in the skeleton, in the entire bones, later can be easily trans, uh, transposed to whatever other aspects of their life. So let's say after uh, 10 years, they have a dispute of water uh, between their gardens that they are uh, watering, yeah? They, know the, uh, they, they would know, they remember this somehow indirectly without even thinking about it, that if I take it all, if I push too much, the other would die. The other die, if I push the one under me, if he falls, I fall, everybody falls. And that message of um, solidarity is nothing that you can just teach by words or literature. You need to have the entire body on it. Is that also something you, you talk about with them? You say it's not, a, it's not about words, mm -hmm. but I can imagine that when doing this, you also have you know, you, you talk about how they experience it. You're confusing them then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do, you, do you know um, these bubble bees, yeah? Bubble bees? Yeah. The bees, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. bubble bees. Yeah. So they are master of aerodynamic, you know? They are this little, and they can uh, go like this. And this is something extremely advanced as a flyer to stop in the in the space and fly like this. This is mastering aerodynamic. Mm. But imagining if they could learn it, <laughs> if they could really read about it, <laughs> would they ever fly? <laughs> <laughs> could they ever fly? <laughs> I, I remember this from my, uh, my, but I learned this, the fact that you need to choose. Either you are here or in your rest of the body. Uh, when uh, I had the classes, my uh, tango and salsa classes, especially Argentine tango classes, I had lots of the students, and uh, they enjoyed them. Then there were some academical, some intellectual, some from university, and I could see them right away from the, uh, the first step they took. And some of them even told me that their uh, uh, salsa practice sent them to me. So. Uh, they, they were here, they kept being here. And when I was dancing with them, trying to teach them, they were looking at the pattern and uh, geometry and numbers of the steps of Argentine tango. So what I, the way I used to teach them was trying to talk with them uh, about something quite not relevant and try to dance to try to, to, try to uh, cut the head out of the body <laughs> and dance with them. Let, let the body, let the muscles and bones uh, follow their steps. And then after some minutes, they uh, realized that they were dancing. And then when, when they realized they were dancing, they, uh, they, they became conscious of it. <laughs> and then, then they stopped dancing. And then they said, I was just dancing. <laughs> what did I do? So you need to choose. There is no capacity in a bubble bee to both fly that perfectly <laughs> and knowing about what, what they do. So we, we never say, but we, we talk about this for uh, among ourselves and among the, uh, the uh, trainers or the, the staff to have an awareness of the different mechanisms that social circus has. Because uh, although it is all fun, but sometimes you can, um, if not properly using them, uh, it can damage because it is a pedagogy and um, maybe a pedagogy? Can, uh, it is a pedagogy of um, uh, social circus pedagogy is a pedagogy of 
using circles and physical art to uh, increase uh, personal and social skills for the, especially children, especially for the traumatized children. But I'm talking about this as I'm, um, uh, I have invented it. But I have, we, uh, me and Beis, we have invented it, or better to say, reinvented it. We had, and the story behind that is that we didn't know it. We, me personally, was never in a, in a circus at all. Uh, in a typical, I saw it in the TV, but never been in a tent circus. Until we went to Afghanistan, and then um, we simply followed the children because I don't have pedagogy uh, background. I don't have any um, any uh, circus uh, training. But children want this. Okay, we just uh, as I, when we cannot be uh, instructors, then we have to be uh, providers and facilitators. So uh, and listen to the children. We didn't have the big references of the books from the university. Then we had to listen to the children, observe them, see what they want, what works for them, and make tons of mistakes and learn from them. And by uh, letting them be our teachers, learning from them and developing the, uh, the pedagogy of social circus. That later, after four years, some French clowns came to visit us, and then they told us. Before that, we call this um, uh, educational entertainment to convince donors to give us money. But then when they came, they told us, huh, so you are doing social circus. And both me and Bert said, what? What, what? what did you say? And then they explained to us that this is actually pedagogy uh, called social circus, practice, developed, uh, when the universities uh, work on. But we, we have already reinvented, very pure from uh, the source, from the children. About Afghanistan, was there already like a circus culture there? Do they have circuses like from way back? Or is it? Uh, there, there used to be sometimes, a um, long time ago, uh, Russians uh, coming to make some kind of uh, circus. And there were some uh, Pakistanis as well. But again, uh, that would be business or show uh, circus where everybody, especially adult men, uh, were passively watching uh, and enjoying. That would be the same kind of circus as here, entertainment. What the circus we have is uh, is social social circus. circus. But when you introduced it in yeah, but when you introduced it in Kabul, what was the reaction of the, of the authorities on what you were doing? Um, maybe I thought it's the first authority that uh, I introduced it in. So. Um, I tried all the Western authorities to, in, to convince that uh, I have something here for the children. Let me, UNICEF, save the children, you name it. All the way from Denmark to uh, Pakistan, where all the organizations were there before. Uh, they came graduate to Afghanistan. So I, they were laughing at me. And uh, I could see from the, um, from the eyes that they were like, how can we get rid of him? Then uh, I came to Kabul on the way, but I had to take a uh, taxi and uh, with some dirty men um, uh, comes a local taxi to, to Kabul. And of course, uh, I was captured at the border of the city. And they took me and um, as much I was explaining about circus, circus for children, they were even more confused because especially at that time, is that emergency of, you know, everybody thinking about security and bombs and all that. Someone comes for making a circus for children. And uh, I was actually so close to be uh, registered and uh, end up to Guantanamo Bay. But serious? Yeah, serious. I By was, the Americans? Um, I was interrogated and uh, body checked and again interrogated and again interrogated. And then, uh, when they couldn't find, they said, okay, we sent him. So I was sent to the next uh, room where the, the different kind of um, registration uh, comes there. And then I started shouting and uh, trying to convince them. But the thing is that I was young. I, am, I was younger that time. And <laughs> <laughs> so I was young. Uh, I was trained. Uh, 
Uh, I have no laptop, no car, no uh, business, any affiliation with any organization, anything. And these are all, and I was speaking the language of the local people, and was, I was with Afghan beardy uh, people. <coughs> so these are our Al Qaeda <coughs> profile, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can recognize, yeah? So, so did they, and uh, they were so 100% sure that I am one of those Westerners, uh, part of uh, Al Qaeda. But um, I somehow uh, did my last shot, and I was really so close to uh, get out of that, and I was. That was a turn of the story. That was a. You're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I missed that part. <laughs> Incredible. So just to, because time is also flying, it's already almost quarter past nine. Um, just give us some numbers. How big are you now? How big is the organization? And how many children do you reach at this moment? Sorry? Yeah, you have the Ooh. Yeah, sure. I have a lot of papers outside about the, the good numbers. You can take them with them. You yeah, can support just them. to have a broad, a broad view, not the exact numbers. No. I suggest you, before going, just take one of those papers. It has some uh, facts and some nice photos. Um, so we have reached 3.8 million uh, children in Afghanistan, in 28 provinces of Afghanistan. And this reaching is at least a minimum uh, of one hour educational performance uh, was shown to them, uh, or they have been part of our uh, workshops like many of these photos that you see. These are, and uh, you have seen the, uh, them in, uh, in your program as well. These are all artists, and there are 1,500 of them every week attending our activities in uh, five regional centers and 28 uh, containers. I have to come back to uh, Fontainer then. Uh, you keep the name Fontainer. Uh, fun Funtainer, is Fontainer. it? Eh? Fontainer. Yeah. Yeah. Not a container, but a container. Uh, and then um, we have had uh, tons of different education uh, performances and from uh, teacher training, training of the trainers, uh, TV programs. So there are tons of, extremely a lot of indirect uh, beneficiaries. Maybe I'll tell you about uh, Fontainer because uh, I have just mentioned it. So you know, uh, there are uh, many containers came to Afghanistan. Most of them brought guns and ammunition and food for the soldiers, for your soldiers, for um, uh, Dutch, for uh, for uh, Americans, Russia, for Americans, for Russians, for uh, Cubans, for all you know, all kind of. It seems that entire human race, all the adult men, have tried themselves in Afghanistan, and. They brought, of course, their uh, equipment uh, with those um, uh, containers, and they left them in Afghanistan. Sea so containers, eh? The, the big ones. Shipping, yeah. shipping containers, yeah. And uh, these shipping containers, uh, maybe at the same time I can uh, show this video of it. Uh, yeah. They are left kind of um, uh, an environmental hazard. And um, what we are doing is we are uh, cutting them, painting them, and uh, making them to something nice and beautiful. And this fun thing is, now we have 20 years. <laughs> we have 20 years of fun in different parts of the country, from orphan ages to uh, big uh, schools, where there are girls and boys in the country, and to the IDP camp, refugee camps, where there are many. Uh, if you can, I'm one of them, you will be signed. So these fun things, uh, they have both uh, a hardware, I would say, which is the equipment, uh, on them, um, a stage, uh, some of them, they have been sound studios. They have, it's like mini culture, 
we have created. And uh, there is a system, I, I call it a software installed in it, that has uh, regional manager, trainer, mobilizer, children, and a program that uh, says when they should do what in which school, what kind of activities, what performances. And those 1,500 children uh, that go to among these uh, fund trainers, they produce performances, activities, training, trauma trophies. They don't call it trauma trophies, but uh, activities uh, for 100,000 children per year. Uh, and this is a kind of system of multiplication. We have to uh, bring the joy of social services to as many children as possible. Because those containers are spread out throughout the provinces, yeah. and they're yeah. filled, like with you said, uh, goods for people to perform, but yeah. also yeah. people attached to it who... Um, it, it has no uh, rent while by, by container. It is very nice. It has no rent because uh, we make MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the schools or orphanage, so they take care of the uh, water and electricity and uh, rent and all of that. And no, we don't need to have a guard there because anybody want to um, steal anything from here should at least for two hours uh, hammering it. And until then, the whole city comes after you. So, uh, and everything is so locally managed, locally um, I, re I remember that we visited one of the camps. It was very touching, of course, because... Uh, First of all, what's so touching about it is you see all these kids which are literally, literally forgotten by the world. There are these, these refugees in Afghanistan itself. They're the lowest of the lowest caste, so yeah. they, have n they have nothing. They have literally nothing. They only have their bodies to work with for if they have work. And then it was, I really have to say, it was so touching to, s to see that those kids, in this case, we saw a film performance. Yeah. And the yeah. film was made, also it's good to mention, by... Uh, some of the kids that work in your film school who make their own yeah, films yeah, because yeah. you explained to me <laughs> Yeah, I was in the film. I was my my first role ever and uh, what, what I was find really interesting is you told me now I remember also that That there is no culture in Afghanistan for kids films. Eh? There's no they don't make like we have zap and all these uh, things that are aimed at children <laughs> But they don't have that. Eh? Yeah. So you're providing that as well with yeah, your yeah. film school. And those films you show at one of those Fontainer locations. Um, exactly that. Um, uh, our social circus uh, is not limited to circus, as you know. We have really defined what social circus is. So circus uh, can be, besides juggling and all uh, circus acts, it can be anything done circusly. So, to us, circus is not uh, a thing or a place, but something bombastic. So if you um, make painting on a huge banner uh, that many children uh, together do it, so it is both social and it is circus. So it is basically social circusly. It is the way it is. And that includes media as well. So, uh, media is another way to, uh, for children to, to understand who they are. And the way we do the media, again, social circuitry, it helps us and help them uh, to, to, uh, to discover who they are. You know, they are just, just who they are. But once uh, they have a camera in their hand uh, or a mind, then they start to frame themselves, to try to think uh, what is, who, who, who am I? Uh, what is good about me? They, they, they start to basically for the first time to become to you know, the, the image can tell them much more than they them, themselves because they, they never see with such a uh, critical eyes uh, who they are because they cannot see. Once they have a photo or a video of themselves made by themselves, then a lot start to think, and uh, that is part of the uh, the process of. Understanding who you are, developing who you are, and then uh, with the others, that comes the social part of it. Try to um, uh, expand your uh, your 
who you are, you're an entity, so it's rough me that now exists, I understand who I am, I clean up my traumas, I master my uh, whatever art, then I do it with the others, so I start to, if it is singing together or acrobatic or whatever, we do it socially, it's very important not to alone become somebody, but together become somebody, and then even there, it is not a stop, and they go to the TV or to the big performances, and then they give it uh, to the others. So it's, a, it's cultivating a culture of uh, progressing you, yourself personally and contributing to the bigger uh, community. Talking about personal stuff, uh, sorry, we, we, we sort of have to almost round up. Yeah. Um, I know you don't like as we mentioned before, it's it's about the social circus. It's not about you, and it's not about Barrett's personal. But what I found very uh, touching is, and, and it's one of the reasons I also uh, wanted to film you, is the sacrifices the two of you make to be able to do this. Because you are living in, in one of the most unstable cities in the world, let's put it that way. Your social life is like limited to a cup of tea somewhere, I remember. We went to a restaurant and you said, well, if I go and get a, a loaf of bread, that's already like my outing or something. That's already, in a, you cannot, if you live in, in Kabul, we, we talked about this earlier, you can't just do every single day, no. like do the same trip or go for the same walk or go to the same time to your work or something because there's always the, the, the problem that you might be uh, abducted. Yeah. Um, so, it is, um, and, 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 and one more thing I remember, now you changed where you live, but you lived in this old building, which was beautiful, but I asked you where, you're, uh, where you were sleeping, and you, you showed me, uh, well, this is my, uh, we, were in, we were in the office, and I said, well, where's your bedroom, where, where do you sleep, what's your private area? You said, that this is my bedroom, and you opened up a cupboard, and you sort of like, kring, 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 and you had your bed laid out, <laughs> in the middle of the office almost, it was like one by two meters, of your own personal space, yeah. that was it. And I think for Barrett, it's about the same. You, you, it's, it's, it's a huge sacrifice. And, and I know you have a very good reason to do it, but what, what, um, how, do, how do you see that part of your, of your life? Now, I see, how do you see that? Because I understand why you do it. We can all see the result, but how do you look to that part of your life, that, that well, private um, part? The word sacrifice, it bothers me, and uh, very often I post me and very or ask for uh, sacrifice. And when I think of sacrifice, the very first thing comes uh, to my mind is, you know, the proper sacrifice. And I ask myself, <laughs> what, <laughs> what is it I am sacrificing? What, what, what is it I am um, uh, cutting the head off? Is it, um, my, <laughs> is it my, uh, like, nights or my uh, time bulletins, my having, going out? Now all the pleasures that you get uh, for granted uh, in the way. Well, yes, but then um, at the same time, uh, I see uh, what I'm getting uh, for what I don't get, for uh, uh, restrictions I put on myself. That are, uh, so what I get is the 3.8 million children. <laughs> just, just imagine 3.8 <laughs> somehow. Somehow, you know, three point, um, you know, I get it. Nothing that is so cheap. That uh, that that personal life is really. Uh, I am the winner. I am, I am very sneaky and very kind of uh, found a way to. Uh, it's like a lotto. Three point eight. If it was one dollar, it was three point eight million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so. And do you have your? Do you still have? You know. But do you still have your little secret treats, the stuff that you can do, like small things that here in the West you wouldn't even think about, like have an incredible cup of coffee or something? Or do you have your little small luxuries that, that, that you really treasure while living there? Yes, he has some good coffee there. I had the first good <laughs> wrong, cup of coffee wrong, in, in uh, five weeks. Yeah. With him, so yeah, he has his own little treasures. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah, of course, yeah. Or chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We have um, we, of course, we try to accommodate to um, to find ways, and you can always find. Uh, yeah. 
stays very I'm mysterious. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was just curious whether you, like, if you have, like, what I said, if you have a, a small coffee place where you can sort of unwind. Because we all need, that, that's what I'm trying to get to, not to push it, but it, we all need some, some private time in our lives to sort of unwind and sort of like, this is my little space where, I, you know? There is this new uh, progress in our organization. We have just had a fantastic um, um, pilot project in uh, Bangladesh, in Rohingya. Uh, um, refugee camps? Refugee camps, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Barry uh, took uh, just four of, uh, basically one, actually one staff and three or four trainers, young trainers, uh, to uh, Rohingya camp, and in just three uh, weeks, they made uh, introduction, performance, training, and uh, those who were trained, the small kids were trained, they started performing for lots of others. And uh, this, this is a secret we are uh, announcing it, that it can happen. It happened in Afghanistan with in, in so many years, but we have developed the, the, uh, the formula for how it can happen in three weeks in a place like uh, Rohingya camp in, uh, in Bangladesh. And uh, we are working to uh, multiply it to many other countries, especially the countries that resources are very limited and uh, needs are very huge. So we are talking about the three uh, biggest refugee camps of the world in Africa and uh, we have been in Zakari camp investigating the possibilities. So what we have developed in Afghanistan and is magic, is really is something that in different ways can uh, can fundamentally revolutionize the uh, humanitarian work, the concept of who is children uh, and how, how we should work with them. The concept of human humani uh, humanity work, humanitarian work and uh, pedagogy. All these three work together if uh, we have good enough luck, uh, would be uh, super in a different uh, perspective with our expansion to other countries. And we hope that uh, this year uh, we, uh, we start, if you keep reading our newsletters, hopefully you are going to have some very good news in the future. I think it's very an sorry. incredible story. Thank you so much for now. Uh, of course, um, there should be the opportunity for people to ask some questions. We limited a little bit in the time, but... Are there any questions? Please, in the back. You started telling us when you t tried to introduce the circus to Afghanistan, which is quite different to what they were used to, um, that you were captured and then you were not Al-Qaeda, and then we kind of dropped off the story where you, you were going to tell us yeah. what happened when you told the first official your plan. Yeah. So I'm still curious. Uh, for uh, a few days, I was in a uh, normal uh, backpacker kind of, and, uh, very cheap place, and then every night, were coming. I was under, um, what's it called? Surveillance? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the very first thing I, uh, I did was finding my embassy uh, that was uh, inside another embassy. They didn't have their, their own uh, space in Afghanistan. Uh, and registered myself, just made, uh, made sure that in case anything happened to me, there is somebody to uh, take care of me. And then uh, gradually they gave up because they, they were convinced that I am now uh, uh, dangerous for anybody and just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't call that crazy. Anybody else? Yep. Um, I wonder if um, maybe you mentioned it already when you talked about the trauma part. Yeah. If sometimes you have to deal with kids um, with, well, let's call it difficult behavior. For example, I work with refugee kids here in the Netherlands. And sometimes, well, there are problems like aggression or kids who don't want to work together. Do you, 
experienced that as well, and how do you deal with that? So, um, you, uh, there are two different worlds, and they synchronize to each other. So, uh, there is aggression here, and uh, uh, there are some different schemes of social circuits that is the uh, exact medicine for them. So you don't go to the child and say, don't be aggressive uh, or any of this. You uh, look at your toolbox of social service pedagogy yeah. and see um, uh, what you have that he could speak, uh, what exactly the problem is, uh, what skill he or she needs to uh, develop. Is it the tolerance, for example, of an acceptance of the other, then the uh, pyramid could help or singing yeah. together could help because uh, you start to listen to the other and give a space and tune to them or to this act of what is it there are different or juggling together uh, and um, uh, what you choose is the, in our toolbox of social service there are different categories of uh, um, what you call medicine or treatment and um, uh, for that case uh, maybe we have six different seven, eight uh, different prescription, then you just provide, not push, not instruct, not anything, <laughs> just uh, provide and try to charm, see uh, to which one of them uh, this person is going to respond, and which one of them is going to be uh, his or her uh, tool. If you are very preserved, maybe they, they use painting, or they are very you know, physical, a different choice. And then, uh, you let them to carry on on that skill, that art, and develop. So um, what happens is here is that um, we are being circus, but what happens is that there's another skill, which is parallel with the, or the same skill transposed to different aspects of their lives is going to be um, implied for, uh, for solving the problem. This is what we approach them, but we never talk about this, and most of it basically comes naturally. Even for us, we I believe that sometimes when we uh, are tricked on doing the right things without knowing that this is the right thing, you know, because again we try to we we have done it by so many years by just intuition and by being open to the children. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think we have to wrap it up time-wise, uh, but you'll be sticking around, eh? A little bit more here yeah. in the in the building. Yeah, that's fine. So, anybody with questions? Uh, Barrett yep, Barrett is there in the back. <laughs> Say wave, 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 Barrett, <laughs> and feel free to talk to them. Uh, the website, it's all written down on the on the on the piece of paper that's yeah. outside. Please take that piece of paper with you, uh, just as a souvenir of nice photos from our <laughs> And uh, thank you so much for listening to us. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs>